¿Le presentas tú a Máximo? Bueno, pues sí, yo creo que está aquí ya preparado. Yo creo que todos vosotros sabéis quién es Máximo Valerio. Máximo trabaja ahora en, en Suiza. Felicidades. Y, pero uh, es conocido por todo el trabajo que hizo con el grupo del University College of London y especialmente como un gran colaborador de Mark Emberton. Eh, es el autor de varias uh, uh, revisiones sistemáticas ¿Mm? y después podemos comentar sobre todo esto y Máximo nos va a hablar del de futuro del diagnóstico en el cáncer de próstata, biomarcadores, con lo cual estamos, eh, estamos trabajando en biomarcadores, eh, la, la comunidad por los últimos 25 años y, y luego hablamos de lo que opina cada uno de, cada uno de vosotros en la sala, entonces biomarcadores, biopsias, los dos juntos o ninguno de ellos. Nos vas a decir que la Emery, que no hace falta biopsia. Me suena, me suena conocido en Holanda eso. Bueno, eh, gracias para la presentación. Estoy encantado de estar aquí eh, esta tarde y para dos días. Eh, parece un congreso increíble y de verdad es un honor para mí estar aquí. Bueno, estas serán mis últimas palabras en español, porque mi español no es muy bueno, pero voy a continuar a seguir en inglés. So, I've been asked to talk about uh, biomarkers, biopsies, both are known in the future of the diagnosis of prostate cancer. So, this is the plan of my presentation. The first is where we are today. I mean, I, I think in this kind of meeting, looking at people who are here, we are not in where the guidelines are, but this is the pathway the guidelines is recommending. And then the second point will be the criticism and why we need to look at other ways to do better for our patients. And then how we can uh, use our biomarkers and biopsy to do better for our patients. So if we look at guidelines, you have a first step in which you have a PSA and a digital <coughs> rectal examination. So when your patient is coming, you, he got his PSA, this is the first time you see him. And then uh, if the PSA is elevated for your threshold, which is different in every center almost, uh, you will consult for a biopsy. And then uh, according to the cancer or no cancer, the patient is going to have other things. So if he has no cancer, you might do an MRI, or you can go back to the PSA and follow him in a uh, few months. If you have the cancer, again, you might do an MRI because you want to look at uh, uh, his risk according to this patient. And then you can choose for himself a kind of radical surgery or radical radiotherapy or uh, active surveillance. Uh, or you can say your life expectancy is so short that you should be just watched. Now, if we look at the pathway, there are two, the two steps. The first one is the screening. Uh, which can be a formal screening, or can, which can be opportunistic in a way you do a PSA when you have a symptom or when you, you think the patient is at risk. And the second step is the diagnosis. So you have a, a marker and then you decide you need sampling. So the question is how we can do better in each of these steps and how biomarkers and biopsy can be better. So always you say if you want to find a solution, you need to find a problem. The first problem is this one. So this is the kind of advertisement you can get, you could get in the U.S. a few years ago, uh, in which you are on the street and you see one man out of six will get prostate cancer. You're free of charge. You can come to my office and you have a free PSA. So patients will say, "This is amazing. It's free of charge. It can save my life." And in addition, this is very frequent. What are the problems of this? The problem of this is that uh, according to from which, kind, from, from which method you use, the overdiagnosis uh, is up to 67%. So it means these are men who will never have a clinically relevant, relevant disease, but they are still diagnosed with cancer within their lifetime. Six, six, seven, 67% is the worst figure, but still it's there. So the first thing, we need to be better, is to decrease the overdiagnosis rate. The second one is that the arms outweigh the benefit. So these are the three publications coming from the ERSPC. 
and you can see that uh, as long as you move forward with the follow-up from 9 to 13 years, uh, the number needed to screen in and the number needed to treat to save one man decrease. But for those men who will live for less than 10 years, uh, or for those who had other comorbidities, uh, the arms are largely outweigh the benefit because you need to screen at the beginning 140 10 men to find one man in which you can save one life. You need to treat 48 men to save one life. So 47, no benefit. So how we can do better? So again, this is about screening. There are two ways. The first one is to use PSA in another way, and the second one is to use novel biomarkers. If you want to use PSA in another way, this is one of the ways in which you can use your PSA. Instead of doing a PSA every year, or every three years, you can use a PSA between the age of 40 and 55, just one measure. And you can look at here this graphic, which is amazing. If you think at how we criticize PSA, this is just one measure of PSA at zero time point, and this is the risk of metastasis according to the percentile. So the guys who are in the 10 percentile have a high rate of metastasis, whereas those who are in the lowest percentile have almost no chances. So one way to decrease the overdiagnosis and to make benefits more for more patients will be to use PSA at the beginning and then to continue to use PSA only in those who are at risk and to avoid to use PSA anymore in the others. So you can use PSA as a trigger. The second one is that uh, instead of using PSA in all comers, all the population regardless of risk, you can use PSA in those men who are more at risk. So there's a lot of spe speaking about uh, uh, Afro-Americans uh, or race, but this is uh, a very nice study in which they look at the patients who carry the mutation of the BRCA1 and 2 genes, and they look at the risk following a normal pathway. So just looking at the benefit for this man against uh, a control population. So when you look at the results, the positive predictive value was doubled in men who had a mutation with the BRCA. And even better, the only patients who had high-risk disease and were young, so which are those men who really benefit from the test, were those who had the mutation. So no man with no mutation had, had um, significant disease before 50 years. So this is another way. This is screening, so using PSA, yes, but using only in target population which are more at risk. Now, by biomarkers, uh, as uh, Dr. Dr. Laguna said, we've been talking about biomarkers. Everyone loves biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we will talk for all the future biomarkers. But this is a nice one from the uh, Finnish arm of the ERSPC, in which they look at the uh, frequent polygenic the genic, uh, mutation in the population, and they look at the, again, target population using a genetic test. What they found is that uh, prostate cancer in 74% occur in, the, in those men who were at risk. So this is again, if you can find at the beginning those men who were at risk, you can better trigger your, 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 your biopsies. More importantly, if we think back to the criticism, is that you can lower your overdiagnosis of 21% using the same pathway, you do the same thing, same biopsy, same PSA, but you just target this man. And you will reduce your overdiagnosis by 21%, which is huge. So you can use the polygenic risk score as a triage test, again, another way to do, it, to do things and to better your screening. This is a very, very elegant study uh, in Dine in Stockholm. It's very interesting because this is funded by the council. And so they, they, they look at their data in Stockholm and they said, this is, uh, so many men are getting biopsies, so many PSA die in Stockholm, there is no effectiveness in all we are doing. And so the council funded them to do a novel test this is a biomarker, but it's a combination of markers. So you got uh, uh, known proteins, so like PSA and other calipins. <coughs> you have 254 SNPs, so a genetic test, and you have <coughs> clinical parameters like age, uh, digital retinal examination finding, biopsy, and family. I need to say, they didn't disclose how, uh, from a statistical point of view, it works. So you don't know whether you have uh, an IPSA and uh, a mutation in the SNPs 
how you can balance these things. But the results are, again, amazing. So when you look at the two populations, so those who were at risk and those who were not at risk, so the overall results looks like this. So if you use the test, the triage test, you will decrease the number of men diagnosed with low risk disease by 70%. You will uh, decrease the number of men who will have a biopsy but will get just no disease by 44%, so almost one out of two. And overall, one man out of three uh, could avoid biopsy according to this test. Obviously, this is done uh, in the first period, so we don't have long-term data, but still, uh, it's, it's a huge difference. So when I, when I prepared my slides, I didn't see uh, there was another speaker talking about this. Uh, I will not go through this, but you will hear about this in one of the next presentations. So this is for screening. Uh, when you get to the sampling, you can do even better, probably, and there is huge evidence. So what's the shortcomings? Uh, what, we need to, what we need to do to be better than now? So if you take random biopsy, the problem is that you're missing your spatial location. You can rather say it's right or left, but nothing more than that. You don't have any information about local extension. Your correct risk distribution is only in 50% of the cases. And this is a good figure because it's compared with those men who undergo surgery. And you cannot follow progression because you have a random sampling. So your chances to get back to that is very low. So how you can do it better? Dr. Laguna said before, but uh, if you use an MRI before, so this is, uh, this is not done by myself, but this is uh, a systematic review of the performance of the MRI. So all serious comparing MRI to biopsy. And when you look at the results, it's actually not perfect. When you look at the precision, so the accuracy, it's not perfect at all. You can see that there are values at... Uh, 33%, uh, some 50%, 44, 72, 82. So this is the number, the two positive plus the two negatives against all the cohort of men. It's not perfect. So you can choose a long MRI. But there are some parameters which are very good. So the first one is the sensitivity. So when you go to sensitivity, so how many you can detect using only MRI, you can see it's very, very high. And you can see there is one series which is low, but all the others are almost over 90%. And this is all serious. There is no selection of uh, expert centers or whatever. So sensitivity is very good. And the other thing which is very good is the negative predictive value. Uh, there is, again, one series which is not very good, 63%, but almost all of the others are around 90% and over. This is only for the detection of clinically significant disease, which, all, which is what we are looking for. So. I think MRI could use as a second trigger after a biomarker. And then if it's negative, it's up to you whether you want to propose some sampling to the patient. And if it's positive, then you need to sample this patient. So when you go to sampling, you can do this in different ways. Uh, but uh, something uh, um, very fashion today is to use the uh, software to do the MRI and transrectal ultrasound fusion. You need to control your prostate uh, on the software. This, this is an old video. And we had to do, I had to do this myself. So you have to control the prostate and the lesion on every slide. And then your software will give you uh, a 3D model in which you will see your prostate, but you will mainly see your lesion. And then you can target your lesions using this software. Now, what's the evidence? Uh, in this systematic review, we look at the old series comparing uh, standard biopsy to uh, fusion-based targeted biopsy using a software. The first outcome was a detection of clinically significant disease. The second one was detection of any cancer, the efficiency and the utility of the two strategies. So there were 14 papers uh, reporting on 15 uh, studies. You don't have to go through these slides, but I would just want to show you that obviously there is an, there's a lot of heterogeneity in these systematic reviews. Uh, the, the population is different. You have men who have the first biopsy, those who have uh, a previous negative biopsy, and the number who have a mixed population. Also, it's different the kind of MRI you have. So you have 1.5, you have different sequences. But most importantly, it's different the, the threshold for targeting. In the first series, uh, almost any man was targeted. And now we are looking at which is the threshold between 3 and 4. 
So this is the primary outcome and this is the results. So the detection of clinical cystic disease for the targeted approach was at 33% against 23% for the standard biopsy. But most importantly, if you look at uh, every study and you look at the absolute difference uh, in all series, uh, there was uh, an advantage for the targeted approach. If it was not the same, there will be in the range a minus somewhere. But you can see that the, the range is always positive between 1 and 41%. So primary outcome, always better the targeted approach. Uh, when you go to the secondary ones, uh, you get the detection of any cancer. So not only the clinically significant ones, but any one. You can see the difference is not so huge. And you get to the absolute difference, you get that there are some in which the standard biopsy perform better. What is huge is the efficiency. So how many, co how many needles you need to find one man with clinically significant disease. So for the targeted approach, you need nine needles. For the standard one, you need 37. Again, the absolute difference uh, is usually in favor of the targeted approach. This is the uh, and very important outcome, which is the utility. So this means uh, the number of men will be missed by one strategy and detected by the other one. So when you look at the targeted, the utility of performing the targeted was important. So almost one man out of 10, and ranging between 5 and 60%. The utility of doing a standard biopsy was quite low, at only 2% of a median, and importantly, between 0 and 7%. This is for standard biopsy. When we did the systematic review, there was not this study which came afterwards. Uh, this is the NIH group uh, recruiting uh, one, over 1,000 patients, uh, all comers again, just uh, um, they had a suspicion of disease. This is the kind of patients I think all of us see in our clinics. So 62 years old, uh, median PSA at 6.7. So when you look at the results, this is amazing. Uh, so the sensitivity of the targeted approach against the standard approach was 77 against 53%. More importantly, in order to find one man missed by a targeted approach, having significant disease, you will need to biopsy 200 men. So in 199 men, there is no advantage in doing a standard biopsy in addition to a targeted one. When you find one man with significant disease, the problem you will uh, find 17 who had, again, low risk disease. And if we look at the first slide and we see we are coming from decreasing the, the overdiagnosis rate, then this is not a good ratio. Uh, this is again quite impressive because this is the uh, accuracy and the performance of the test compared one against the other. So this one is the targeted approach alone, this one is the standard approach alone, and this one is combined. So any of us thinks if you get two tests together, they are, they are better than one test. And actually when you look at the sensitivity, the combined approach is the best one. Uh, when you look at the negative predictive value, the Combined approach is the best one. But when you look to the accuracy, so again, three positive plus two negative, the best test is the targeted approach alone. And why is this? Because you get so many men who are, who are suspected to have a, a risk, high risk disease, and in fact, they don't. So according to the accuracy, and if your accuracy is your, your best value, you should perform only targeted. So this is my, my last slide. I think the future is here for most things. Uh, we can do much better today. Uh, the guidelines uh, are always in late with the practice, uh, but uh, we can do a number of things. The first one, uh, we could use a PSA at the beginning, but just repeating those who are really at risk. We could use PSA in targeted population. Other novel tri triage tests, I think we are not ready. The Stockholm, test, uh, the Stockholm uh, uh, trial will get new results uh, in uh, one or two years. And I think we are ready for uh, imaging and targeted sampling. Thank you. <coughs> bueno, yo creo que igual lo que hacemos es eh, dejar para el final las preguntas, porque bueno, si hay alguna pregunta de la sala que le queréis hacer a Mario. 
Ha dicho muchas cosas interesantes, ¿eh? pero yo creo que igual lo dejamos para el final, que así mezclamos un poco todo y, y estamos... Bueno, eh, la siguiente conferencia, la siguiente charla, eh, nos pusimos en contacto con el equipo de Heidelberg y entonces eh, Jean-Philippe Radke eh, aceptó la invitación para venir porque su grupo también es un grupo que está trabajando mucho en cómo hacer las biosis de distinta forma. La verdad es que aunque eh, está un poco adelantado en el programa es por un problema de horario de avión que tenía que, que marchar eh, pronto a la tarde y entonces es el motivo por el que lo hayamos incluido aquí, pero nos parecía que era muy interesante lo que, lo que nos tenía que decir y sobre todo eh, agradecerle, ahora que nos lo va a escuchar, espero, agradecerle eh, el haber venido pues a que ha llegado al mediodía y que se marcha a media tarde a, de vuelta a casa. ¿no? Entonces nos va a hablar de la detección del cáncer de próstata que es el que nos interesa, el clínicamente significativo, y eh, utilizando la, lo que nos ha comentado Máximo ya de la resonancia eh, fusionada con, con ecografía. Ok, good, good afternoon and thank you and it's, it's been an honor to be here and to speak uh, to this uh, audience who, is, uh, who are experts in, in the field of um, at least not only biopsy, but also of, of biomarkers. And this is uh, quite interesting just for us and for our group and, and for me in particular to, to be part of this. So thank you very much. Um, what our idea is, this is the current standard. The current standard is within diagnosis of prostate cancer. There is the trust biopsy in the center of diagnosis. And what I want you to show is how we can bring the MRI and the MRI transfusion biopsy from the peripheral to the, to the center of the biopsy and the biopsy approaches. And um, for that, we have to answer four teaching points. The first is problems of conventional 12 core trust biopsy, as Massimo Valerio told before. Second one is MRI and transfusion guided biopsy, what it is and what we have to know about. The third one is compare this to the standard approach of 12 quadras, and the fourth is uh, what, are, what are the pitfalls of this. So starting with the problems, and this is what we all know, that um, 40 to 50 percent of biopsies taken by the 12 um, core truss approach uh, detect low-risk prostate cancers that won't affect and won't threat the, the patient's life for over at least 15 to 20 years. And the second one is okay, thank you. And the second one is upgrading Gleason score compared to radical prostatectomy from biopsy in 35 to 65 percent, and low detection rates around maximally 40 percent. And this means that up to 80 percent of significant cancers and 90 percent of bilateral um, tumors are, are missed by the transrectal approach. So the second one is under diagnosis of aggressive disease. And putting this together, and this is why, and as Massimo Malaria told before, also from the group of London, this is why we missed those cancers because um, the biopsy needle in the truss approach is too short. It's around 1.7 centimeters, and this is why we miss apically and anterior um, located prostate cancers. And we miss a second, and this is important. So these are data from uh, Sweden with around 50,000 men underwent biopsy, 6% urinary tract infections and 1% hospitalization. And there are also uh, some death among this um, trust biopsy. And what is also increasing is the resistance um, of fluoroquinolones regular given against uh, Escherichia coli, and um, which is very important is initial prebiotic resistance in 24% of patients. So um, what do we do? It's an aggressive and it's um, mostly in cost, inc in cost increasing approach. There's a transperineal biopsy approach. We do it in Heidelberg. So um, this occurs less infection of 0.1%, 
and it causes, in some cases, urinary retention, okay, and hematuria. What do we need to, to perform for a fusion? Of course, we need first an MRI. And this is a picture of um, what we're doing. We first perform the MRI and then fuse a live truss over this MRI and plan this digital, uh, digitally and then um, just perform both. On the one hand, saturation biopsy. However, you can do a saturation or you can do a 12-core biopsy as a systematic part of a fusion biopsy. And on the, other, on, on the other hand, perform targeted cores who are done in these areas where the MRI is positive. So which are the advantages of this approach is, okay, um, first you can document where you took the biopsy. This is important for radical prostatectomy, but also for focal treatment. And what we saw is that um, doing and performing this MRI transfusion, we saw that we are very accurate and very exact of around two millimeters uh, correct for um, what we, uh, where we did the biopsy where we planned it. And what you can do here, and what you can see is, okay, you just performed, uh, just performed the biopsy where you planned it digitally, and then you can see, okay, where I have to go to target um, this, um, the core, and then you perform it. And then you can measure, okay, how good I am or even how bad. What do we need for this MRI, so-called multi-parametric? And this is just the combination of morphologic and functional MRI. And we start with morphology and just perform a T2-weighted imaging, followed by um, contrast, um, for, by a perfusion, and the contrast is so-called DCE, and you measure just a arterial input function, and then you measure a curve, a contrast curve. The third, it's a little bit historically. At the moment is this metabolism measurement of choline and citrate peaks. And the fourth is the new kid on the block is the cell density measured by diffusion weighted imaging. And this is uh, very important because um, I will go later back to this because this allows you to, um, in a way, predict Gleason scoring in a way. And the good news are when you perform an MRI, leave the metabolism away because it's not easy to adopt and it's much, much better for your radiologists and the perfusion is also questioned. So what you need is basically T2-weighted and diffusion-weighted imaging. What you do then? You do structured reporting on, uh, on the five-point Likert score from one point, uh, from one point probably benign to five points probably malignant or highly probably malignant and that you do for every lesion and for every sequence. So, as you can see here, you have T2-weighted imaging, you have DWI, and you have um, contrast agent. And as you can see here, two lesions, one in the anterior part of the prostate and one in the peripheral zone and the dorsal part. And as you can see in the T2, okay, you can see here the lesion then you perform diffusion-weighted imaging. You can see here and here in the ADC mapping that is very, very dark, so it's also five points. And then you perform the contrast um, examination, and then you can see, oh, okay, here I see a fast input and an outwash, so it's again a five. And then you perform an overall pirate score, and the overall pirate score per legion is in this fact a five. Does this work? Yes, it does. First, um, data from external validation with an area under the curve of 0 0.84. Very nice results um, published in 2012. And also from our group, um, did the same one year later and also had for the Likert score a very nice and accurate area under the curve of 0 0.88. This was accumulated in a meta-analysis from the colleagues of Nijmegen in uh, 2013, including 14 studies. And here you can see as well accumulated area under the curve of 0 0.82. So meaning um, pirate score works. And it does not only work, it can, only, it can also predict, and it can also predict significant cancers. Um, as you can see here, for a pirate score of four, as we remember is, um, yeah, 
looks like that it is a malignant lesion. Okay, you can see here a positive predictive value of 68%, uh, and for a pirate's score of 5, a positive predictive value of around of over 80%. So these are very um, encouraging results. Then, this is when you implement a new test, you always have to uh, compare it to the standard. And the standard is, of course, still 12 trust biopsy. And here are results from a group of Norway and um, in, um, together with a group of Los Angeles. And they did a one-to-one -one allocation of um, MRI transfusion biopsy compared, uh, compared to the standard biopsy approach and seen completely the same groups. And what they saw is, first, clinical significant prostate cancers detected by targeted biopsies were significant, and as you can see here, significant more um, clinical significant prostate cancers were detected by this um, fusion approach. And on the other hand, only 5% of those clinical significant cancers were missed by the targeted approach, and in addition, 11% by the MRI alone. And what are the cancers that missed? These are, in fact, mostly Gleason 3 plus 3 and, and also clinical not significant cancers. So also get in, in a way that the MRI transfusion is very, very efficient. Group from NIH, as uh, Massimo Valerio told before, this was the, the prior very interesting paper of them um, looking at repeat biopsy uh, patients and detecting that multiparametric MRI and the transfusion on top misses only 7% of significant cancers, but did not detect 36% of those clinical not significant cancers we might not want to see. And this is also good for the Likert score, is that per Likert score that increases, you have a 2.5-fold uh, probability of significant cancer. I'm just going short through this because we had these results before. Just one, um, just one sentence on that. Um, targeting biopsy diagnosed 30% more high-risk cancers compared, compared to 17% fewer low-risk tumors when the transfusion approach is, com uh, is compared to the um, standard 12-core approach. So very interesting. And this slide is nearly the same but it is so impressive that we have to uh, repeat it. The number needed to biopsy in addition of a performed targeted biopsy is extremely high. So you have one high-risk cancer, you need 200 biopsies, and this is also more impressive in, in my eyes to detect one high-risk PC more. You, you detect, on the, on the other hand, 17 low-risk cancers. What did we do in Heidelberg? We compared this to, the, uh, to a saturation, a transperineal saturation biopsy, and we found nearly the same. We found that MRI-targeted biopsies detect 46% of clinical significant cancers compared to 8% in addition of the saturation approach. And this is also um, in discussion how many cores you need. You need three targeted cores and seven systematic biopsies to detect one um, um, clinical significant cancer, and this is also um, an advantage of the, of the MRI transfusion approach. Just two short slides on fusion platforms. If you are interested in those fusion platforms, you need to um, compare rigid fusion and elastic fusion. The, the um, advantage of elastic fusion is that after every biopsy you take, it is um, the, the fusion will, will get back to the, to the prostate form you had before the biopsy, and this is not the same with the rigid fusion system. With the rigid fusion system, you have to think about, and you always have to renew your, your fusion, and it doesn't do it for itself. Does this have an impact? And some studies, yes, it has. Here, comparing elastic fusion to rigid fusion, um, detecting that the elastic fusion approach detects more um, significant cancers compared to the rigid one and also compared to cognitive fusion. Um, these data suggest, okay, throw our cognitive fusion away um, and just always buy uh, an elastic fusion system. 
Um, not really. Published last year, 2015, by Pane Bianco et al. Also interesting data and um, supporting the guys who perform cognitive biopsies. Here you can see, okay, um, what, what did they do? They performed MRI and targeted biopsies, and if negative, they performed saturation afterwards. And as you can see here in this group B, they detected 410 patients with significant prostate cancer and only nine addition cancers. Um, on the rebiopsy, so meaning that um, there is a high sensitivity of 86% and a high, high accuracy of 97% for a cognitive fusion um, approach. What did we do? Um, we wanted to know, okay, how good are our, our targeted parts and the saturation part of our fusion biopsy? And we compared it to radical prostatectomy specimen. And we also took um, the MRI for the loan and looked, okay, how many um, index lesions, meaning that it is the, the tumor-driven lesion of the prostate um, or within the prostate are detected by the different approaches. And what you can see, we start with the combination. So perform saturation or systematic biopsies and perform targeted course together, um, detected 96% of these index lesions correctly compared to radical prostatectomy specimen. And what you also can see is that the targeted part alone only detects 80% of them. So, um, meaning, okay, there's still a problem, and which is, this is a problem we have to solve. So why do we miss, compared to the MRI, 12% of cancers? And this is, in fact, as you know, okay, 80 is good and 92 is much, much better. However, this was statistically significant, as you can see, okay, fusion, um, targeted biopsies alone are s inferior com um, to the combination of those. And in case of detection of an index lesion or of significant cancers, we have to do and we have to favor both the combination of saturation and of the targeted course together. So having an aggressive approach, but also doing then and, and looking at and seeing 96% of index lesions. So what can we can we see and, and looking at this, at this cohort, we can see, okay, we correctly identify by MRI 92% of all index lesions. And looking not only at index lesions, but at significant cancers, we have 84%. But we see, okay, targeted cores alone are inferior to the combined approach. And that leads us to the fact that biopsy targeting is not perfect yet. Nearly this similar results at, uh, as a group from uh, France detected one year before. So um, what about the transperineal approach, aggressive approach, not very cost effective, but we can see, okay, this is as good as the MRI, but it missed some cancers and it increases adverse events and it increases the detection of, in, in, of insignificant prostate cancer. So what we can do now, we can stop the discussion and say, MRI transfusion targeted course is very good. Use it. Um, not without talking about these pitfalls. And these pitfalls are important, and we have to talk about them for a few slides. What is important and what we have to think about. And we have to think about the first is an MRI problem. It's the underestimation of tumor volume. And as you can see here, nearly around all tumor volumes, you can see it. The tumor volume is underestimated around 10 to 30 percent compared to radical prostatectomy. And this is important not, not only for biopsy, but also for targeting um, your focal therapy, but o not only for your focal therapy, but also for radical prostatectomy. And this group from New York suggested to perform a safety margin for therapy planning of around 9 millimeters and to enlarge your MRI lesion to get, an, to get correctly um, identify the, the yeah, the, the volume of this lesion. The second one is, how good is our radiologist? So it belongs to reader experience, as you can see here. Yeah, in the peripheral zone, the, the inter-reader agreement is very good. However, in the transition zone of the prostate, it is not as good, because in the transition parts of the prostate, false positivity is a problem, because false positivity occurs when you see a benign lesion within the prostate, and you say, okay, this benign lesion is diffu in a diffusion-weighted imaging. It's very dark, and the diffusion is restricted. However, 
it's a benign nodule and not prostate cancer. And also in the transition zone, the problem is what about DWI and DCE? As you can see here, it doesn't matter if you perform um, a, a contrast agent examination or not. And this is nearly here the same. When you perform a biparametric MRI, T2-weighted imaging plus DWI, you are as good as you perform a multiparametric one. So um, this is what we, have to uh, what we have to talk about. And the last problems are, what about these Pirates 2 lesions, remembering probably benign? And if you're looking at nearly all publications, you have this false negative rate of 5 to 12 percent. What to think about this? Tell the patients, okay, um, you have not a prostate, a significant prostate cancer, but the risk of having it is 5 to, uh, to 12 percent. Perform a systematic biopsy in case of that, or related to clinical probabilities, and um, just look, okay, um, has the, the patient the risk of cancer or even not? And it's nearly the same with PIRATE 3 lesions. There is variable tumor detection, as you can see, between 10 to 70 percent. It belongs on which publication you read. And um, what we have to, to do with this, biopsy every patient and uh, having the risk of a 90 percent um, negative, um, negative biopsies. Um, and what about um, the, the ADC on the MRI? And what about ESPC risk calculation and clinical parameters? Do we have to put them together with the MRI result to get a, to get a valuable um, uh, prediction and not having this range of 10 to 70 percent. The answer, in our opinion, is clear here because the cutoff is very nice and um, the risk is minimally 10 percent, so biopsy it, right? So this is very important. And last issues, multifocality. We know that if there is a solitary tumor lesion within the prostate, we'll find it. However, in case of multifocality, we'll miss more tumors. And characterization of aggressiveness, and this is what we need to, to discuss with our radiologists is, okay, this importance of the diffusion-weighted imaging, so as low the ADC value is, as high the probability of having high-risk prostate cancer is within this lesion, and this picture is very impressive. As you can see here, this dark region, you can see, okay, as dark and as low this ADC is, as you can measure it automatically. As dark this lesion is, as higher is the, the Gleason score you have. Okay. Just one look in the future. What can we do with MRI? We cannot only measure this ADC, but also this ADC entropy, for example, or impressive data from Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, looking at 10 different MRI parameters that you won't see with the eye, but you can measure them. And what they think and what they do is compare this low-risk cancers compared to intermediate and high-risk cancers. And what they, what they can, they can defer this in on MRI and with a very nice um, accuracy. And this may be the future of MRI, not only looking at two or three multiparametric um, sequences. Okay, so in conclusion, looking a very busy but it will be solved quickly, 90% of the cancers we want to see, clinical significant ones, can be detected by MRI and we do not see the cancers we probably won't want to see. MRI targeted biopsy alone has fewer and better biopsies. However, we miss some cancers, around 15%. Mapping remains the gold standard because we found nearly every cancer with the costs of increasing costs and increasing side effects and probably overdetection. And I think we or we think you should um, individually go to your patient and tell him, okay, what do you want? Reduction of overdiagnosis, then perform targeting alone with the risk of 15% having cancer that is not detected, or you want maximum safety, then get the combination. And uh, dealing with the problem of the targeted, we suggest to perform target saturation of this area uh, in case of a positive MRI. So I hope we are getting this change and getting the MRI and the MRI transfusion in the middle of the, of the prostate biopsy approach. Thank you. <laughs>